Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I'm going to tell you about one quick thing before tonight's story, and I promise this is actually a quick thing. Blair Daniels, the author from No Sleep, actually has a new book out. It's called Don't Scream, 60 Tales of Terror by Blair Daniels. You'll see it on your screens right now, and it's available on Amazon. The link to it should be in the description down below. Check it out, folks. It's really worth your time. And honestly, guys, the book's $2.99 for 60 stories. That's kind of a steal. Grab yours now over on Amazon. And on to tonight's story. It's late September. Remember those nights? Humid, muggy, just a hint of the coming fall. Too cold for a t-shirt, but too warm for a sweater. These are the nights best spent at Cook Place Community Mall. In my modest Midwestern hometown, a diamond in the rough in my eyes. This shopping center is a break from the monotony of tired hardware stores and family grocers that lined up Main Street. The Cook Place Mall is typically packed to capacity. But not tonight. Because it was 8.15pm on a Tuesday night, 45 minutes until close. Not exactly prime window shopping hours, but despite that, my three friends and I were still going strong. We were ending the night in the dusty arcade located in the basement of the shopping mall. It was down a short flight of stairs between the Dairy Queen and Sparrow. And the one in the food court. Faded and flickering carnival lights lined the dimly lit hallway and steps. Andy, do you have another quarter? Philip, my youngest friend, questioned as the words game over splattered across the screen. Philip was 12 years old, a bit underdeveloped for his age. Andrew, his older brother, my best friend, and my biology partner scowled as he rummaged through his pockets in vain. Maybe if you were a bit better at the game, I'd have more quarters for you to play on. It was 8.15pm, and it seemed our time in the arcade may have been coming to a close. I had a few loose quarters left in my pocket, but that was going to stay my secret. I was hoping to spend it on a coke tomorrow before class started. Clay, a guy Andy and I had just met in biology, had clearly been waiting for this moment. Honestly, yeah, guys, it's getting a bit late. I think I'm gonna bounce. Gotta study for our exam on the cellular reproduction. The exam wasn't for a week yet, but I wasn't bothered. Clay had been acting a bit ambivalent since we got to the mall. Seemed he wasn't a huge fan of having Philip around. Cramped his style or whatever. I didn't care. Philip was pretty much like a brother to me, so he came first. Philip, having realized there would be nary a quarter for him, gave up aimly pressing the buttons on the greasy machine. I have to go to the bathroom. Didn't you just go? sighed Andy. Yeah, but we have a large soda. You had a large soda, kid. By the time I got a sip, it's all backwash. I chuckled as Andy and Philip started away from the arcade machines. Clay, while texting, followed lazily behind them. It was 8.24, and we had located a bathroom. The bathroom we were used to using in the mall, on the way out to the front doors, was closed for renovations, so we had to find another one. An L-shaped hallway, lit with yellow, humming fluorescent lights, ended with a corresponding bathroom on either side of the hall, with custodial equipment blocking the women's entrance. Philip rushed into the restroom. The mall closed at 9 p.m., so we were going to need to get moving. Sure enough, as the thought crossed my mind, the ratty old male intercom crackled to life with a ding dong. Adolescent male's voice spoke sharply. Mall closing in 30 minutes. I checked my watch. It was 8.26. Huh. Someone's in a hurry to get out of here tonight? I thought, that's retail. Clay spoke up. I might just get going, you guys. I live pretty close to here. I'm gonna walk instead of the bus. Good night. Night, Clay, we all said in unison. He turned his back and walked away, turning right to depart the mall. Andy and I looked at one another. I don't know. Kind of a wet blanket. Seems really cool when I met him, Andy explained. Nah, he, he was okay. Maybe just a bit quiet. The texting was a bit annoying, though. Our attention was drawn to the sound of a flush from the bathroom. Andy's face twisted into a mischievous grin. Hey, we should give Philip a little fright when he comes out. Remembering how jumpy Philip tended to be, I felt a pang of guilt. It really wasn't very nice to spook him, and 
we did it often. Nevertheless, I stood on the other side of the door, opposite Andy, waiting for Philip to step between us, not expecting a thing. The door swung open. Philip stepped out into the hallway, focusing on drying his hands on his pants. He stepped by, none of the wiser. Nah! Andy yelled, and we each grabbed his shoulder. Philip yelled as he twisted around and fell backwards. Philip fell into the wall. And that's the only way I know how to describe it. One moment, he had slipped off his feet and crashed into the wall. And the next, everything but his legs had gone through the wall, as if there was a perfectly shaped hole in the concrete. And Philip's legs spasmed in the air in the same looping spasmic pattern, but for only a few seconds. And then... Then there was nothing but solid concrete. Wait, I... Andy stuttered as he fell to his knees, his face a mixture of curiosity and confusion, and he shuffled towards the wall, his, his face turning to fear. I... I don't, I don't understand. I... Philip! He shouted his brother's name with a desperate, wavering cry. F Philip! He slammed his hands into the wall, once, twice. Not a third time. Andy's head now protruded from the wall facing the ceiling. His head seized from one side to the next as he continued to scream for his brother. God, he, he sounded like he was yelling through a box fan. I stepped forward as my best friend disappeared from sight and I was left with his scream bouncing off the hallway walls, intensifying as it mixed with the hum of the fluorescence. The howl of the fluorescence. My back pressed against the bathroom door and I jumped. I screamed as my world exploded with static, deafening and blinding me. The noise was unbearable and the grain obscured everything. And all at once, it stopped. I clutched my head in my hands, eyes squeezed shut. The static had dissipated but was replaced with the hum of fluorescent lights and the all too familiar yellow glow through my eyelids. But there was something new. A smell that hadn't been there before. The musty, wet smell of carpet. Carpet that should have been changed decades ago. The smell reminded me of the dilapidated bowling alley down the road of the mall. I opened my eyes. Before me was the bathroom hallway, as expected, lit by the same light as before. The bathroom doors were... gone. There, there were no more doors, no more custodial equipment, just a smooth slab of concrete wall. I got to my feet, I looked around. It seemed I was in the mall, but, but it was quiet. It felt different. The fluorescent hum buzz it was too loud. My ears itch. I walked down the hallway in the direction of the food court. As I turned the corner, I was met with... Not the opening to the food court as expected, but by another abrupt 90-degree corner, turning to the left. Ding dong. I froze. The loudspeaker was engaged. The empty air of the speaker nearest me told me that, but the operator had nothing to say. After a few motionless moments, what felt like hours, the microphone snapped back into the console, cutting the empty noise. Whomever had activated the speaker seemed to have hung up. Confused and growing ever more frightful of where I had found myself, I turned the corner. I was met with a large, empty room that I had never seen before. It was about the size of a classroom with stained concrete walls. The smell of must was even stronger in here. Each wall had an identical rectangular door-shaped opening that seemed to be placed at random decided positions amongst the wall. The popcorn ceiling, littered with smears of dirt and greasy imprints, had long cracks spanning it. This room was clearly in need of renovations. I don't understand, I muttered out loud. I truly didn't. This featureless room served no purpose other than a passageway to the other rooms. The lack of planning and absent attempt at caring for the room made me feel as if this place was long forgotten. Might as well try the next room, I thought to myself as I walked through the door to my left. The room I found myself in was bleak and unrecognizable at last. 
From my first glance, the only difference in style was that this room was shaped like a triangle. I heard a single cry from my right. It's more of a whimper, actually. What the fuck? It was Clay's voice. It, it couldn't be Clay. I watched him leave the mall. I rushed through the door to find Clay lying in a fetal position on a long hallway, stretching a distance to my left and right. Change the channel. Change the... Ch change the channel. Ch change the... Clay babbled incoherently as he sobbed on the floor. Clay. Clay, you gotta get up. Clay didn't respond to me. He never would. His eyes, wide and unblinking with fear, were glued to the floor. How could these fluorescent lights be so damn noisy? And I saw it. And I felt it. It hung motionless in the air, feet lightly scraping the ground. It had dry, cracked skin that was dressed loosely with torn, rough, spun shorts. It had the torso of a man, but its torso was on the wrong way. It, its frail and feeble arms outstretched to the ceiling, not quite reaching, as if in an act of surrender. It had a cocked head as if confused, and it peered down the hallway at me, dark, beady eyes staring widely at me through the holes in the bloody duct tape wrapped around its head, and then it started to float towards us. Every time I blinked, stunned in absolute terror, it would not be where I was expecting. A few feet forward, some inches to the left, never where it should be, and yet, yet it was getting closer, ever closer. What I saw next will follow me forever. I turned to run, breaking the stillness, sprinting down the hallway. I don't know. I, I, I guess I just assumed Clay would follow in the moment, but I was wrong. A blood-curdling screech shook the hallway, and I whipped around. It had reached Clay. He still wasn't looking, but he was certainly screaming. It extended its long, spindly arms and cradled him like a child, but he wouldn't look away from me. No, its eyes never left mine. In one quick, jerky motion, it was holding Clay by the top of his head, palming him like a baseball. I blinked and... It grasped Clay's arm with its free hand. With brute strength, it twisted Clay by the torso. Clay screaming, cut short with a fleshy crunch. As he dropped to the floor in a twisted pile. His eyes had finally opened to look at me one last time. And then I screamed. The louder I screamed, the louder the fluorescent hum became. Which was louder? I couldn't tell. I turned and I ran to the first door I saw, blindly twisting and turning through the rooms that followed. Why on earth does every room look the same? I turned a corner and ran face first into a dark mass. We both fell to the floor. Andy! How did you get down here? Where the hell are we? I don't know, Andy. Where's Philip? We have to get him right now. We have to leave. We turned to rush down the third hallway, perpendicular to the hallway Andy and I had met in. We ran until we felt like we couldn't run anymore, and then fell into the final doorway. We landed into a mass on the damp floor and quickly scuttled to the back wall. The hum with lights was all we could hear, louder and louder, and then... They all went out. Silence. We found ourselves in total darkness. A total silence. As we clutched each other. No, not total silence. The sound of static as if emitting from a television slowly coming towards us. Only when the light coming from the source of the noise started to slowly illuminate the room did I realize. This room had only one door. It floated around the door frame, toes dragging on the floor as it cast its bloody eyes upon us. Andy and I, mute with fear, stood against the wall. Andy moved himself in front of me. It floated towards us. Andy raised his arms. It reached out for us. Leave us alone! Ding dong. We all became statues. We locked eyes with it as we listened to the intercom crackle to life. Shallow, rapid breathing came through the speakers. 
Andy? It was Philip. With a guttural scream, Andy lunged towards it. It fell backwards into the wall, and I landed inside of a trash can. I was inside a trash can filled with the refuse from a, a full day of food court disposal. What? Hey, kid. What are you doing in here? I looked out to see a very confused elderly janitor, wondering why a young man was taking a sparrow bath after mall hours. It was 9.32 p.m., at least that's what the clock over the water fountain said. The water fountain? I'm back in the mall. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, I was just hungry. And I ran. In the following years, I'll try to make sense out of what happened in the back hallway. I went so far as to returning there, trying to access that place to no avail. I never found a thing, but I kept trying till they demolished them all a year later. Philip and Andy's parents weren't really present when they were around, so they didn't they didn't make much a deal on TV when they were interviewed, despite the media trying to fire them up. It just seemed like it was the final straw to send them to total apathy. Last I heard, Clay's parents moved out of town. But they were paying exorbitant PI bills to find their son. After a few years of half-assed detective work and a few rotations of milk cartons, Andy and Philip were forgotten by our sleepy little town, but sometimes... Sometimes when I'm going to sleep, I remember... I leave the TV on. Channel 13. There's nothing broadcasting on that channel. But the static. The static helps me sleep. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you for listening to tonight's video, and quite potentially tomorrow night's or last night's video, depending on how many times I've reused this recording. I especially want to give a big thanks to Eric Mary, John, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Frederick LaRue, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Saeed Alyasin, Tyler Ramberg, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, the Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Melissa Siegwert, Chempinski, Daniel Rao, The Ginger Bros, Andrea Solvik, and Andrew Steinberg. You guys and everybody who is supporting on Patreon are the real MVPs. And if anyone would like to join them, you can always check me out at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Or if you'd just like to support the show without, you know, Patreon... Then honestly, every view or minute or however you watch or listen to this creepy pasta story time on the YouTube live stream or here on YouTube, the podcast on Amazon, Google Play, and on Spotify. And if you'd like to support my wife, then there's nothing better than listening to scary stories with some Dungeons and Dragons themed herbal teas. Etsy.com slash Ivory Monocle Tea. All right, kids. Thanks so much for listening. And sweet dreams. <laughs>